So it is somehow July, and it's quite scary that it's July because it's gone way too fast. Um, we've reached that halfway point of the year now, so we've got six months left ahead of us. Um, and I'm doing well on my Goodreads challenge. I think I'm about, I think I'm on target actually, maybe one book ahead. So I think I've read about 50, 51 books. So doing well. Um, and now I guess I'm here to do the books that I'll be reading for July with my new theme. The theme for this month is probably going to be the biggest challenge for me that I've probably done this year, which is exciting in itself, but also a bit daunting, I guess, maybe. Who knows, we shall see. But anyway, the theme for this month is a month of reading classics. Um, if you've been on my channel for any amount of time, you probably realise that I seldom read classics. I've read um, a few modern classics, um, usually from like the 1930s, I guess, onwards. Um, and I, I do enjoy some of them. Uh, most of the reading that I do is contemporary, if not, you know, recent, at least within the past 20 or so years. I've kind of had a bit of a tumultuous relationship with classics in the past, in that I find it really hard to find ones that I actually like and enjoy. Um, I have <laughs> had very bad experiences. I, I really don't get along with, at least, Charles Dickens' works. Um, I've had zero interest to read Jane Austen. Like, the, the books just don't sound interesting to me. A lot of the classics that, you know, are the most talked about classics tend to be sort of of the premise that doesn't really grasp my interest. Of course, most of the classics that I have read have been through school. Um, I've tried some outside of school, particularly I've tried Charles Dickens outside of school. And there have only been really two classics that I have actually enjoyed enough that I've kept and reread. And those two are The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, of course, and Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Now, those two books are ones that I I do really enjoy. And so what I thought for this month is that I wanted to find classics that I thought had similar themes to those two because then at least uh, there was a more likelihood that I would enjoy it. I want to give classics a go, basically. I want to, to, I want to read some books that have withstood the test of time and kind of inquire why they have and whether we do actually need to, you know, really praise them to be such works of, of wonder or not. I, I specifically wanted to also look at British classics, so classics written by British authors, um, not only because it's like, it's that's my heritage, I am British, and it's part of my cultural history, but also I think it would just be a bit too easy if I had gone for looking um, for translated classics. But I've chosen to get some classics from the Penguin Black Classics series. Penguin Black Classics are beginning to broaden in a really great and interesting way. They're, they're bringing more text to light and actually they're bringing more diverse text. They're bringing text from um, other languages and other cultures um, and sharing them whilst also bringing back some classics that might have like kind of fallen off the radar within the British canon. So I've got three Penguin Black classics here um, and I've got a wild card at the bottom also which kind of goes against everything I've said I would be reading. Um, but you know these are the ones that I thought would be the most appealing to me. So the first one that I've got to read is The Italian by Anne Radcliffe. Anne Radcliffe is a probably one of the most famous British um, gothic authors that there is. Um, I've been wanting to read some of her books because they have sounded intriguing to me for a while and I know that you know she is a big name within this sort of romantic gothic genre. She was writing in the 18th century I believe and this book is the oldest book on the list that I want to read. It follows a an Italian man who has fallen for a woman and um, the mother is kind of against this relationship. I believe there's also a monk who um, was part of the Inquisition who kind of has very dark motives and you know he will go to any length to fulfill what he thinks is right. I do also believe that Anne Radcliffe writes sort of slightly supernatural um, elements in her book, so I'm intrigued as to how that's going to play a role in this book. The reason I chose this one, not only because um, I want to, to read some Anne Radcliffe, but also because I think the, the themes in this one sound the most similar to the themes that I enjoyed in Wuthering Heights, i.e. that sort of 
dark love, that dark romance, and the sort of the the family politics behind it, and also the supernatural kind of dark gothic themes of um, of Dorian Gray, especially in reference to sort of the sin and immorality um, of Dorian Gray, which I think I'm going to find in here, or at least I hope I'm going to find in here. Um, so that's kind of why I chose this one, and I'm intrigued as to see whether it will kind of satisfy what I am looking for from it. So we shall see. I think of the ones that I have, this one's my favourite cover. I love this image here. Um, and I'm hoping that kind of sets the tone for the story that's inside. So then the next one that I chose, <laughs> I chose this one like off the premise of it without quite realising just how chunky it is. And that is Lorna Doon by R.D. Blackmore. Now this one is massive. I think it's about 700 pages, which is like the story itself. And there's a lot of notes because there's been a lot of revisions and editions of this um, story. Blackmore himself was writing, I believe, in the mid 19th century. And he, despite moving around a lot in his youth, he was a sort of Devon writer. So a lot of his books, particularly this one, are set in Devon. He has many books, he has written many books in his past, but I think most of them have actually fallen out of print. So this one is his most um, popular and the one that I guess brought him the most fame and renowned. When he was writing, I think he was a very beloved and well thought of writer, but I guess now he's kind of fallen off the, the wagon, I guess, of the canon of classics. Lord of Dune is set in Exmoor, so it's not exactly the closest to where I'm living, but you know, we I have of course driven through and past Exmoor a few times in my life, and I think that is something that definitely draws me to this. It's about a man who I guess falls into the Dune territory of the of Exmoor. Um, it's like, a, I guess it's a valley where a family of the Dunes reside and kind of run the roost, I guess. And, of, and then he falls in love with a woman called Lorna Dune, and there is trouble with that relationship. Again, the reason I chose this book was I think it might perhaps have the most relation to Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights, of course, is set on the Yorkshire Moors. I think the, the Moors themselves play a really big part in that book. Um, and this is set, of course, on Exmoor. And, and I have heard that Blackmoor writes um, place really well. So I'm hoping that he really captures that sense and that essence of the Moors um, and of Devon, which is a beautiful part of the country, I may say, but I'm not biased at all. Um, so I think that's what I'm looking for within this book. It does also have that sort of forbidden love element to it that you have in Wuthering Heights. I don't really think this has much to do with Dorian Gray. Um, this more kind of appealed to me because of its links with Wuthering Heights. I just can't get over how big it is. So I think this is probably going to take me quite a while to get through. We shall see, but I am quite excited for it. I just wish it wasn't in the shiny version. I kind of like the matte versions a little bit better. And then the final black classic that I'm going to be reading is Maurice by E.M. Forster. Now Forster, of course, is a well-known classic writer, and I know lots of people love his work, um, particularly Howard Zen and stuff. I know Jasmine from Jasmine's Reads, um, she really enjoys his work, and she, I guess she, her enthusiasm for some of his books in the past made me more inclined to pick some of them up. I wanted to read some Forster for a while. I was intrigued by his first book, but then this book kind of spoke to me the most of his, of his like, collection of work. This was a sort of turn of the century, um, pre-First World War classic that follows a gay relationship. Um, it wasn't, it was written in 1914, I believe, but it wasn't actually published until after Forster's death in 1970 because of the themes and the subjects within it, um, and also perhaps the reflection that might bear on his real life. For me, that that's quite moving, um, that, you know, he had this work and it just wasn't published for his lifetime. It kind of reminds me of Ernesto from Umberto Saba. Um, so that kind of excites me to read it, to kind of see the reflection of the story that's being told here and how that kind of relates to the context in which it was written and then in which it was subsequently not published. As far as I'm aware, it kind of has that sort of coming of age story, but I guess a, a little bit later in life in which you're coming of an awareness to your own sexuality. And I'm really intrigued to see the queer themes of this book and, and to see whether it kind of has those similar queer themes that you get in Dorian Gray. Of course, Dorian Gray wasn't 
as explicit. It, I mean, it was, you could definitely read it there. It wasn't quite as explicit, but it was still used as like a, a sort of a weapon against um, Oscar Wilde's personhood and casting him in this sort of homosexual light in which kind of put him in a lot of trouble, ultimately. So this one I'm definitely intrigued about and I'm hoping that you know, whilst it's not going to be sort of dark and gothic as Dorian Gray was, it's going to have that sort of charm and that really um, poignant story within it. So those are my three black classics. I know a lot of people don't tend not to like the bl Penguin black classics because they're so easily scuffed and they're so easily um, sort of bent, folded, and they just kind of get a little bit they look worn very quickly, ultimately. You just have to read them once and they already look so well loved. Um, and they, I, don't, I don't know, I like the look of them being scuffed and having broken spines and everything on the shelf, especially when they're together. So, you know, we shall see what these books look like by the end of the month. The final book that I want to read is The Wild Card and it's one that um, it's one that I've talked about on my channel before, and that's Against Nature by Joris Carl Heismans. Now, this book is sort of the book that made a big impact on Oscar Wilde's life and inspired the picture of Dorian Gray and is also mentioned, I believe, in the picture of Dorian Gray. Um, it's a French classic, so, you know, it's not British, but it inspired a British classic. Um, and also, it's a River Run edition, it's not a Penguin Black classic. The reason I got this one is because this is the latest translation and um, the cover kind of appealed to me quite a bit. Um, I, if I do enjoy it, then I will, then I do plan on picking up the Penguin Black Classic Edition because I also love that cover with the yellow painting on the front, um, but also because it will be nice to compare the translations and to compare the different editions to see how similar they are and how a different translator can interpret the same text. This is basically a French Hellenistic, um, dark sort of seedy story it follows a sort of man of noble um, birth going into like the dark underbelly of society around him. So of course you can feel that picture of Dorian Gray like theme to it. I think this was written around a similar time to Lord of Dune or maybe a little bit later um, but not too much later. So it's kind of that mid to late 19th century I believe era which you know in the UK which in England was like the Victorian times. Um, so there were a lot of society rules and I guess this just breaks them all. At least that's what I'm hoping for. So they are the books that I'll be reading for July. Now there's only four here instead of six which I've been doing for the other month. First of all is because I know for a fact that I'm a lot slower when it comes to reading classics. Of course there's like sort of language barriers that you've got to get used to because sentences were constructed differently, people spoke differently, people wrote differently back then, but also just because I, I think I think it just takes me a lot longer to get into a classic than it does a contemporary book, which I could just kind of fall into quite quickly. So I've chosen less because I know that it's going to take me longer to get through them, but also because I do plan on reading other books alongside these, which are for a very exciting reason, because the lovely Amy at Amy Gets Lit um, and I are beginning, are in the beginning processes of setting up a podcast. Um, so that's something to look forward to, but I'm going to be reading some of the books that we're going to be talking about on our podcast um, over this month so that we can get the first few episodes recorded um, before they are released for you guys. Um, but, you know, over the coming weeks, you'll, you will, of course, be getting little hints about the podcast and where to look and where to find it when it does eventually come out. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, and yeah, that's my reading month planned ahead of me. So I'll see you next time for another video. Bye bye.